morning or afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Boyarski. I'm a venture fellow here at New Chip, which is an online accelerator that helps startups grow and fundraise. Uh, today, I'm joined by three very interesting guests as we talk about what startups need to know when it comes to the law. It's often enigmatic and confusing, but hopefully these three lawyers will kind of help us navigate the ins and outs and really figure it out. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, I'm first joined by Samar Shah. He's a patent attorney who represents startups and establishing uh, tech companies and kind of helping them get their IP figured out early on. IP is always a, an interesting thing for startup. When do I file? Do I need to file? Um, there's a lot of questions there. Samar, thanks for joining us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm happy to. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And yeah, IP is an interesting and often arcane subject, especially for startups. So I'm happy to to you know talk about that and hopefully shed some light into it. I'll just give you a quick background on myself. Um, you know, I started my career out in Silicon Valley. Uh, I worked for a, a tech-focused firm uh, called Fenwick & West. I did a lot of patent prosecution there. I represented Facebook and Google and Twitter and GoPro on a lot of their early patents. Um, and then I you know, moved to a New York-based firm uh, called Paul Hastings, where I did a lot of patent litigation work, uh, high-stakes patent litigation work for companies like AT&T and BlackBerry um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and now, uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, we moved, my wife and I, we moved to San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and, you know, I represent a lot of uh, enterprise clients out in California still, and also a growing number of startups here in Texas. So it's been a interesting journey. And I've, you know, uh, na help, help clients navigate through uh, issues from being a bootstrap startup to venture back startup to, uh, you know, late stage and, um, you know, public companies. So I'm happy to kind of uh, provide some guidance or at least some uh, interesting anecdotes about what those experiences are like. Awesome, Samar. Thanks for joining us. Um, I, I think one thing that's really interesting in this discussion that really kind of pervades not only the IP side, but just the legal side in general, which is that startups are often cash poor. And so then it becomes a strategic question of, you know, what is really valuable? And I think that that's kind of a more nuanced discussion in terms of does your startup really need IP? And it will really kind of be company specific, but your expertise is uh, great and we're, we're really happy to have you. Um, you. Next, we're joined by Kevin Hyatt. Um, he started his uh, career in civil litigation, but kind of has tr quickly trans uh, transferred over to more transactional stuff and startups and business. He's based out of Austin, Texas. We're really excited to have him, have him here. Kevin, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, appreciate you having me as well. Um, yeah, I actually got started uh, my career after my undergrad was uh, my undergrad was in media arts, film, essentially, and then uh, I did a business management minor focused on entrepreneurship. Um, I had my own recording studio to help pay for um, the bills and get me through college, and so I've got a little bit of entrepreneur's uh, experience in that sense. But uh, my technology background, I had kind of had to be my own IT guy with doing all the sound for uh, music. And then I actually started doing sound for television and uh, kind of make a long story short, I got connected with a, a law firm partner in Irvine, California. Uh, I grew up in Southern California and he wanted some help with a, his uh, home recording studio and I needed some extra work. So he saw my technical skills and said, you know, we can, we could use some help with these, uh, these technical cases, working with technical experts and everything. And uh, so I realized quickly when I got there, there's a lot of people that didn't like technology in the law firm. I loved it. And I saw a lot of opportunities to improve uh, upon the technology they were using, help to like, design new databases to deal with uh, complex business litigation, uh, electronic uh, document discovery and that kind of got me into the legal world. I loved the opportunity to work and represent different companies that in a variety of fields and industries. I loved learning and uh, that gave me that opportunity. So that's kind of how I got into law, I decided to go to law school. And, um, and then, you know, years later, I, I moved out here to Austin and litigation is less of a, priority here, at least from my experience, there's a lot more of the technology startup companies 
And even the non-technology startup companies, there's, I, I work with a variety in, in energy, oil, gas, uh, manufacturing, and they had a lot of needs that, that I was able to fill. So I just kind of, kind of happened organically. And I started helping out some companies, uh, started out, whether it's a single person company or a lot of companies, primarily after the funding stages where I, where my expertise is, uh, a lot of times companies struggle to pay for attorneys when they haven't got their funding yet. And uh, there's, there's a lot of firms around here that do a great job of investing in companies and making a little bit that burden a little bit lighter. Um, unfortunately, I'm not in that position, but I, I, I work with a lot of different other law firms here in Austin. And uh, I just love the entrepreneur spirit, the startup. Um, I'm a wannabe in a way, you know, I have a small practice, but um, uh, I, I just love people seeing people have an idea, build it into something that, uh, you know, impacts the world in, in whatever way they can. So yeah, uh, that's kind of my background. That's awesome, Kevin. It's great to have you. I think that a lot of lawyers close to the entrepreneurial space still have that kind of classic legal risk aversion, but want to be closer to that excitement and <laughs> enabling entrepreneurs. So it, it's awesome to have you. And as you mentioned, um, I think that this panel is really interesting because you've got a tech background. I have an engineering degree and so do Samar and Dave as well, which in the law is often you know, not very common. As Dave said beforehand, you know, lawyers don't even like math, let alone engineering. But I think <laughs> the perspective that engineers provide is a very calculated perspective. Um, I think that we kind of think about things more in terms of litigation costs. We think about, well, what's the likelihood of this going to trial? We think about in terms of what's the expected value and what's the cost to, you know, getting an IP or doing this filing. So I think that taking that into account is a uh, you know, really helpful when it comes to lawyers, because it, it gets closer to the entrepreneurial perspective of this is a, a game of calculated risks and law is just another calculated risk that we have to think about. Um, so thanks for joining us, Kevin. Last, we've got Dave Gamel, who was uh, formerly a partner at Brown Rudnick and at Wilmer Hale. He currently is a partner at Gunderson Detmer. He focuses on emerging companies, financing all the way from small, small companies up to those that are uh, private equity funded. Dave, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, thanks for having me, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. So uh, much in the way that, uh, that Kevin finds himself every day helping companies you know, do all manner of general counsel things, that, that's what I do on a daily basis. Um, just give you a little background on the firm I work at, Gunderson. We're about 300 attorneys. Uh, we do three things. Uh, we help venture funds. Uh, form their funds. We help venture capitalists invest in companies. And we do what I do primarily, which is act as outside general counsel uh, for companies. And so on a day to day basis, I'm helping companies from, you know, the two guys in the garage start and form the entity to begin with to helping some of my larger clients, you know, do fairly significant acquisitions, do finance along the way and do all manner of strategic relationships. My background, um, I was a nuclear engineer prior to going to law school. I'm a glutton for punishment, um, which is how I ended up doing this for the last 23 years. But what I like about what I do is, you know, exactly as Kevin said, the, the entrepreneurial spirit is very infectious. As an engineer, I'm, I'm intellectually curious and I represent tend to represent companies in tech that are often doing hard tech. I, I represent a company called Commonwealth Fusion, which is trying to commercialize fusion energy. Uh, we've raised about $220 million for them so far since startup. And um, understanding the technology and being able to get in and dig in with the engineering team, understanding, and I'll be the first to admit that I don't truly understand what many of my companies do. You know, I, I get the basic physics, um, but, you know, I don't understand at the level they do, but being able to speak their language and, you know, at least understand the physics is actually helpful. And when you're doing financings, it's amazing the number of attorneys you run into on the other side that can't operate a basic spreadsheet, or if they are operating a basic spreadsheet, don't understand why they keep getting the wrong answer because they don't look under the covers at the math. Um, and like Samar, I um, am actually a licensed patent attorney, but unlike Samar, I've only ever prosecuted one patent and I hope to keep it that way because that was just not something I was very good at. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, th Dave, thanks for joining us. Um, I think we really have a really interesting kind of group of experience here between your kind of medium to big law experience, Kevin kind of smaller firm, and then Samara on the IP side. Um, and, 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 you know, I think that the, that engineering degree really comes in because sometimes, and this is where the takeaway for the startups listening is more about finding an attorney that matches your company. So if you have an attorney who has that kind of technical background or works with a lot of technical companies, when you explain some sort of complex idea, they'll understand at least the sort of initial background information to determine whether or not you even need to file a patent on this, whether it's, you know, some sort of software company that's got a proprietary algorithm. Is that something that we patent or just trade secret? And so I think that your experience really matches well with those tech companies. Dave, thanks for joining us. Um, so let's- My pleasure. Let's go ahead and jump into sort of the first topic, which is what startups need to do versus what startups want to do. Um, as Kevin said, you know, he usually gets involved after there's been a financing and once money's flowing, it makes a lot of sense to do, um, you know, some of those legal precautionary insurance kind of uh, filings and just, you know, compliance issues. So let's just open the floor and, you know, ask the question of like what startups, mu what must they do when they get started? In terms of a legal a legal component, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start because it, it's funny, you know. Kevin's out there, I think, being a good business partner. All these folks, we we try and do that. That's the thing that I like is to be the business partner. Uh, well, uh, because I'm at a little bit bigger firm, we have the opportunity, as Kevin was saying, to invest in some of our clients, and that includes investing some of my time. So, the part that I actually like the most about kind of the formation process is, is, is not even the legal part. I think the thing that before we could dive into like absolute legal, I think the, the most important thing for a startup to do is to have good communications among the founders. And I think a role that we as good business partners play is we can help them have communications about things that they don't know that they're supposed to be communicating about. And in setting up the company initially, you know, dividing the equity, talking about the expectations. Okay, are we going to get this thing funded? How are we going to get it funded? If we ideally get it funded, what does that mean? When am I going to be happy? How much time and energy am I going to expect? What's success for me and my team? All of those things are so critically important. And I feel like people that start companies are so passionate about the problem that they're solving that they often don't talk about what solving that problem means and what a successful outcome means to them. And they just assume. And so you get down the path, and I'm sure, Kevin, you probably have plenty of experience with this. You, you jump in, they get just got financing, and they're like, holy cow, what does that really mean to me? And what do I need to do now? So I think our first job, quite frankly, as lawyers and good business partners, is to force people to have conversations that they may not want to slow down and have. And then there's a million, you know, little legal things that they need to do. But the, the point that I'd like to make first that that communication and to your point, Jonathan, about finding a lawyer that matches your style for your company, not only from a tech, do they get it, but also can I communicate with this person in a way that I can get trusted, valuable advice? And are they giving me the feedback as a business partner? Because tons of people can give you the legal answer. You know, we all went to law school. We can all look it up in a book. We can give you the legal answer risk adjusted kind of for your situation background experience sort of thing is not something that that many people do and so matching up and, and and even people that do it really well don't do it well for all communication styles so you got to find somebody that matches that's the first thing from a legal perspective i think startups should do is find that legal partner that they can communicate with that they can trust that they trust their judgment with so I think I think that's I've dominated great. the floor. <laughs> so I'll, Dave, I I'll think see that's a, my. <laughs> I think that's uh, a great point, and I think that lawyers really should be, especially in the startup and transactional world, should be first business advisors. Um, which is to say that we have this legal background, but the truth of the matter is there won't ever be any dispute resolution if there's no dispute. And so if all the founders are talking and figuring this out, and then you sort of you know codify that agreement with some sort of contract or you know, some sort of uh, founder equity grant, um, you know, 
then the expectations are laid out. And this is where I think the lawyer plays an important role of first saying, well, have you guys figured out what you're doing? And I think oftentimes, like, you're, you know, people get really excited and they get really gung ho, but they don't always take that step back. Um, Kevin, how have you sort of found that to be? Yeah, I, I was actually going to just piggyback on what David was saying, because the number one thing I would say is that whole partnership with the attorney, finding the right person or firm that fits with your personality and that you, the biggest thing I see is trust. Can they trust you? And that, that involves a lot of stuff that involves not only maybe knowledge in the area um, that, that your company is or whatever industry it may be, if it's the technology, uh, but also personality I I've found, and I won't get into details, just, you know, attorney client privilege and, and personal information, but I found that the psychological side of starting a company or growing a company, because a lot, again, where I, I sit, it's usually when they're, they're starting to really want to grow or are, are on the path, they're growing well. And when they're trying to make important decisions, I, I realize that the psychological component, their stress, anxiety, whether it's founder, uh, a single founder or multiple, that the dynamics between them and then the dynamics with their, if it's uh, manufacturing, the distributors or their, um, the people they have working under them, there's a lot of nuance to that. And when you talk about just general risk or um, the costs of doing business and everything, a lot of times that doesn't come into play. And trust is a huge thing that I've been able to see in what my clients have told me. And I think the reason why every client that I have is with me is because they trust me, not because even that I'm the most expert in the specific field that I'm working in, but I, I also can create or uh, use the relationships I already have to work with other firms when I'm not an expert in it because they trust me. They know I'm going to say, we need to get uh, another firm to, to work on this. And uh, so, yeah, that trust is, yeah, uh, I think the biggest thing I've seen. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that trust um, in terms of, you know, just businesses in general is important. My dad is a small business. Um, he hasn't really used lawyers at all because his entire business is based on trust. And in a way he's won, he saved a lot on transactional costs. He doesn't have to work about uh, dealing with lawyers. Uh, and every time I try to give him, you know, some legal thoughts, you know, I'm, I'm not barred yet. I'm still in my third year of law school, you know, he's always like, no, 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 that's not how that, that's not how that would work in practice. And so I think that really taking into account that business side of things is really important. I don't want to neglect though, the importance of uh, patents and IP early on in startups. There are some startups out there that have such a unique idea that the first thing is, no, we need a patent today because Facebook and Google and Twitter are all working on similar things. So Samar, do you want to talk about how, while there are business considerations, sometimes the answer is no, 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 we do need this patent? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I think so. Um, but before I, I, I touch on that, I'll, I'll just second what Dave and Kevin have already said, you know, uh, I work with a lot of clients and I also interface with their corporate counsel all the time and having that trust factor and having that trusted advisor relationship with your corporate counsel is so, so important. Um, you know, in, in terms of, um, lawyers on the IP side and specifically on the patent side, I would encourage, especially startup clients to think about their IP attorney in terms of whether they have done a lot of startup patents versus patents for large enterprise companies. Um, the nature of those two patents are completely different, right? For large enterprise clients, uh, often they're innovating in very crowded spaces, right? Uh, and then the incremental uh, improvement over an existing technology is kind of what those companies are focused on and what those IP attorneys uh, uh, in turn are focused on. Uh, startups by definition or often by necessity are you know, focused on growing an entirely new market. Uh, and those patents require a different, almost a different kind of thought process, right, to, to prosecute, where in, you know, crowded spaces, you want to very sharply define the scope of your invention to be able to differentiate it from what else may be out there. Whereas uh, for startup patents, often you want to broaden the scope of the invention, right, because you don't know what pivots are going to happen, right, or how the technology is going to change or the use case is going to change. Um, so, you know, have those conversations with your IP attorney 
journey, it's very, very important because if you end up getting an incremental patent on an IP that should have been foundational, you have potentially really significantly limited the scope of your rights. Uh, but having those conversations with your IP attorney early on in terms of what are some of the use cases here, what are some of the implications of the underlying technology, and you know who could be a strategic partner in this space, and how could this technology be used in non-conventional ways, I think those conversations go a long way in terms of protecting your IP appropriately. Yeah, um, I think that's a great point. Um, and I think that there are, you know, oftentimes we see patents and IP much more as a binary and either you do this or you don't. But I think that there are a lot of strategic concerns in terms of, well, would we actually litigate this on, on this? Would we, you know, prosecute this patent if it ever came down to it? And I think that those are the questions that startups are asking. And I think an intimate knowledge of technology and the, you know, those industries is, is really, really important there. Um, I want to kind of now switch over to the next point, which Samar, I think that this is kind of a good segue, which is when do companies, when should they do this? You know, like imagine you've got a, a tech, let's say a hardware based company, they raised $50,000 from friends and family, both of them quit their jobs. This is mainly, you know, money to keep the lights on and pay for some licenses on, let's say some expensive tech software. You know, do they really want to carve out 10 to 20 grand to, to get a patent if they're, you know, still kind of ideating and still kind of innovating? Yeah, so that's a great question. And to me, the answer really falls down on three or four different dimensions, right? One is, you know, how, how much R&D time and effort and cost are you going to spend pursuing this piece of technology, right? If the R&D costs are significant, right, and switching costs are significant, then I think it makes a lot of sense to protect that with, you know, strong IP filings. Um, if the switching costs or the R&D costs are minimal, then I would say, you know, yeah, you know, we can always pivot and when we have more budget, we can, you know, file patents at a later point in time. Um, the second dimension that I would think about is, um, you know, what are, um, what are the, if you're going to raise money, right, from venture capitalists, uh, how are venture capitalists valuing intellectual property in the startup, right? So for our startup clients, we spend a lot of time looking at who are some of the ideal investors and venture capitalists, and what is the portfolio or the patent track record of their portfolio companies, right? Uh, and if we know that, you know, certain venture capitalists, you know, their portfolio companies are patenting at a very high rate. Um, and if, if we can, you know, compute some kind of evaluation multiple off of that, then we have a pretty good idea that, hey, filing IP early and often, we're going to get a return on it, especially at the valuation stage. Some VCs, you know, in their portfolio companies don't file any patents whatsoever. So, um, you know, in those cases, we can, we can skip it. So there's some value to, to the patents from a valuation perspective for a startup as well. Um, the second is, you know, how big is, or the third factor is how big is the market that you're going to pursue with that product, right? Um, patent lawsuits, as you guys know, are very expensive. Um, I have never been involved in a patent lawsuit that, you know, our clients haven't paid you know, about $10 million plus, right? Uh, so they're very expensive. According to the American Bar Association, the median cost of a patent lawsuit between two competitors is about three and a half million dollars. Um, so I say you have to at least 10x that, right? That cost of litigation in terms of a damages claim or you know, in terms of what you're doing in terms of revenue. Um, so those are some good metrics to keep track of. Uh, you know, how big is this market? How much revenue are we gonna generate off of this product? You know, what are some of the valuation benefits that you can get from venture capitalists or other investors? Um, those may be some good metrics for you to start you know, developing in terms of an IP strategy, you know, and obviously there's some technologies where timing is of the essence. And in those cases, you want to file early. Uh, but uh, often I find that, you know, startups and and us as patent attorneys, as, uh, as professionals are shooting from the hip, right? We're just saying, yeah, you should file as the general consensus advice. But, you know, when you start looking at the data and peeling some of those layers, you can get a much better answer often. Yeah, I, th I think that that's a fantastic point. And I kind of uh, appreciate you diving more because that, you know, the answer is always, well, it depends, but uh, kind of explaining those factors and really going into those details, I think will give a clear idea. I also think that that VC points a really important one. I, I had a call last week with a VC fund that only invests in companies with patents. 
They're only interested in protected spaces. Um, a veteran, they're a great VC fund. Um, and they have, uh, you know, their own in-house uh, counsel to help with that, to say, you know, we're kind of willing to, to go to bat for you because this is really important. Um, Dave, what have you sort of uh, experienced in this realm? Yeah, I, I would um, uh, second a lot of the stuff that Samar said uh, in that. Uh, I, I think the thing that I would add that you said to begin with is all about strategic value, right? And it's all about how you measure that strategic va value. It's also about timing. Because uh, never mind patent litigation, which is mind-bogglingly expensive. I mean, just mind-bogglingly. So, it, it, you, you know, that's kind of the, the last resort if you're a startup, because I don't know a single venture capitalist in the world that really wants to fund a patent litigation. Um, you know, big companies use that as a competitive weapon oftentimes. And, but I think that it's really important to think not only about are you securing some strategic advantage and whether that is a strategic advantage against your competitors or strategic advantage can be, you know, how you're valued and, and, and who values these patents. Because oftentimes I think, and I have lots of friends and lots of clients who are venture capitalists, I, nobody really, you know, even good patent attorneys can't tell you how defensible your patent is going to be in the entire world until it's issued and, and challenged. And so, you know, it's, it's all a game of margins that you're trying to figure out and probabilities. I, but there is also another piece to this, which is, okay, you want to put a stake in the ground and oftentimes what people will file provisionals and, and, you know, that sets a timeline. And as soon as you're on the patent timeline, patents can get very expensive to prosecute especially if you're prosecuting in foreign jurisdictions. And the number of clients that, you know, aren't uh, kind of well advised or that come, I get patents out of the university setting. And then, you know, because the university tries to patent the universe, not tries to patent a, a competitive advantage. And then because you've already started this time machine of, you know, okay, we've got a file here and now we've got to enter the foreign prosecution phase and, oh yeah, we're going to file in all these places. If you don't narrow that down, pretty quickly the patent costs can become an extraordinary burn on the company. So I think there's a lot of strategic thinking that goes into these sorts of things. And I think that, you know, the many patent attorneys, not because they don't want to do the strategic thinking, but because their clients don't know how to engage them to do that, or because they don't wave their hand and say, we got to think about this differently because, you know, they're out working so hard to prosecute all these patents. You got to take that step back and say, okay, why are we doing it? And why are we prosecuting in a patent in outer Mongolia? Is that really going to be a good market for us? Or, you know, even Japan, just the cost of translation in, in some of these jurisdictions is insane. And so I think that's a, that's a key factor. So from a timing perspective, I think you not only have to think about what is the strategic advantage that you're trying to capture and what you're doing, but also what does that mean for knock-on costs? And, and some companies, you know, it's incredibly valuable. Their patent portfolio is huge. I have a, a, a company in the laser space that has a, a significant number of patents, and that's going to be really a lot of the value because they've pivoted over time to, to various things, but those patents are incredibly, incredibly valuable. And I've got other companies that can't drop the patent prosecution fast enough to get the burn rate down because it's killing them. So, yeah. And I think that that's a, a really great point, especially going back to sort of what we were first talking about, which is trust. You know, you go to a patent attorney who doesn't have your best interest in heart and he might say, yeah, let's file 10 patents. I can, you know, rack up a bill, make my money and you can be on your way. And so I think that uh, especially in cash for startups, having a strategic, like a strategic partner as a lawyer, and having this sort of outside GC who really has your interests at heart, at heart is, you know, willing to say like, oh, you know what, we don't really need to file this or we can wait to file this. And that can really help startups that are, you know, sort of struggling with burn rate and trying to keep that low enough so that they can keep ideating and keep innovating. Um, Kevin, let's, uh, let's jump to something a little bit different now, which is one of the questions I always get asked, I filed an LLC online, um, you know, using some sort of legal Zoom, whatever. I've got an investor saying they only invest in Delaware C Corps. I don't know if I really have the, the money to switch it over. 
Um, sort of when do you recommend they, they switch over if they have started an LLC? And, you know, is that really worth the, the five to 10 grand that it, it might cost to switch over? You know, that uh, question, I may not be the best uh, for that. I haven't had that specific situation. I'm generally still on the uh, other end of once the, the entity is already formed. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say like about the legal zoom and everything that there's a, and we may touch on this later, but uh, I know a lot of attorneys discourage that stuff, but I think a lot of times with startups that some of that stuff's great, but a word of caution. Uh, one thing that I would say is, is to have those things reviewed by attorney possibly. And the more forms that you're filling out, the more likely you're going to have issues. I definitely have spoke, spoken with several attorneys that say that, that legal zoom and, and this is especially in like estate planning and some other stuff where it, they've got more automated systems that those have actually given them more work because they're having to redo things. So I think a lot of times at least have somebody review it. And that's what I say with most of my clients, because they don't necessarily come to me with every legal issue. Um, it depends on the company, what their needs are, what their financial situation is. But um, yeah, as far as, as changing the entity, I, I, I'll probably have to defer to the others. Um, that would be uh, one thing that I would have to be researching or, or speak with uh, some of the other counsel that I work with at other firms. But uh, yeah, yeah no, sense. but I think you raise a good point, which is sort of doing it right the first time. Um, sort of if your path is towards this high growth, you're going to need uh, most likely yeah. Delaware C Corp. And, you know, you might think that you're saving money in the short term, but sort of doing it right once it will, will definitely save you money because transferring that over can be, uh, you know, really confusing. Dave, what's your experience with this issue? Yeah, I'm happy to, uh, to address that directly. The, first, I think, uh, just to add to what Kevin said, which I, I think, you know, there is a get what you get what you pay for kind of aspect to this sort of thing. And there are services out there that are pretty good at doing formation documents and automating it. What you miss out on is you miss out on some of that conversation that we thought that we talked about before that I think you can really get with an attorney that's helping you form the business. I think there's a couple things to think about here. So uh, first is, you know, many people think, oh, I'm going to go raise venture capital money. This is going to be great. I'm going to grow a big company. I'm going to be rich. And, you know, the number of companies that actually raise venture capital is a small fraction. The number of those companies that are actually successful is even a smaller fraction. So, you know, while there is clearly a bias in the venture capital arena to have a C Corp. And if that's what you're going to go for, you know, go raise venture capital money, you most likely are going to be a Delaware C Corp. And so if you're most likely going to be a Delaware C Corp in, in absence of some, and, and you really think you can go raise the money, go form a Delaware C Corp. But if you're going to go raise venture capital money, and you're going to go form the Delaware C Corp. Can you convince one of the many law firms that do this sort of thing, either for free or on a deferred fee basis, that you're a good bet to do that on a deferred basis or on a free basis and get their forms and their documents right out of the gate? Because if you can't, the likelihood that you're going to be able to convince a venture capitalist that they should invest their money in you is low. And so I think you have to be very realistic about this. And so the answer to the question really is, when should you convert? I don't know that you should start as an LLC if you think you're going to get venture back. But if you do start as an LLC, if you're taking venture money with few exceptions, you're going to have to convert before you take their money. Now, if I'm if I'm that person, I've got the LLC, especially if I was in a services business that I'm trying to convert into a SaaS business because I've created some software to support the service I'm, I'm doing. I think that I would, you know, leave it in LLC until I got the term sheet and not go out and convert that because, hey, services, businesses, maybe you can actually get, you know, revenue positive or, or profit pro positive, and that might be a good entity for you. But you're going to have to, with, like I said, very few exceptions, you're going to have to convert to take that money. Um, 
Yeah. So that, that, that's kind of, I, I think the answer is, you know, don't, don't do a bunch of legal stuff too early. And that me being the lawyer, you know, that sounds really kind of crazy for me to say that, but I often tell founders, you know, don't even create an entity until you start dealing with third parties where you've got potential liability or until you really need to concentrate IP ownership in an entity because you've got multiple participants creating this IP and nobody wants to assign it to just one founder. Because most of the other stuff, even equity splits, you can accomplish in kind of contracts and things that mean that you don't have to spend the money up front if you're not ready to launch and engage with third parties. Yeah, I think that that's a, a great point. And I think that we often talk about how money is kind of hard to come by in early stage startups, but so is time and resources and energy. And so if they're sort of spending all this time working with their lawyer, figure things out, and it ends up not working out, well, maybe that time could have been used towards, you know, sales or ideating or working with third parties to figure out how to, you know, really get this, uh, you know, working up and running and, and to a point where people are buying it. And I think that, um, you know, it's obviously uh, company specific because there are some companies that need to take on, you know, an aerospace company might need to take on 10 million, need all of that patents up front, need all of the legal work done because they're going to be raising multiple rounds and are five years out from revenue even. Uh, same thing with pharmaceutical companies, you know, it can take a long time to get through that drug approval process. But I think that on other startups, um, you know, where it, it, that's not the case, uh, Dave, I think you're, you're kind of points and advice are exactly right, which is, you know, do what you have to and do what you have to to protect yourself from liability. And Samar, I'm sure, you, you know, you feel the same way. It sounds like everybody on this call is sort of what I would say a, a cautious, but reasonable attorney, which is doing what you have to to get to the next step. And Brad Feld talks about this in terms of money, you know, mark your next step. What would say, you know, that that's a, a milestone we want to get to and then raise money to get there. And I think that the same sort of approach should be taken to your legal. Well, what do we need to do to get to our next milestone? What is absolutely necessary? And then really just focus on that. Um, so I think, Dave, those are great points. Samar, what's your sort of experience on this? Yeah, and I don't have anything specific to add here. Um, but, you know, just conceptually, I have, you know, I find this easy to explain to, you know, technical founders, you know, everybody, all the technical founders I work with understand the concept of technical debt, right? You may take some shortcuts in your coding process uh, to get the program up and running, but you know, you're, you know you're going to have to fix it later on. And I always explain this as a strategic legal debt, right? Um, so you know, I find that lawyers generally do a good job of filing paperwork, right? Even filing patents. Uh, but you know, uh, have, have we considered all the kind of the strategy uh, issues associated with it? And if you don't, that's okay, right? But just know that that's a technical debt or strategic legal debt that you'll have to pay off at some point and start thinking about it as the company grows, right? Um, so I think, I think you know, as you mentioned early on in the call is everything is a cost benefit, right? Uh, and, and this is one of those, you know, same concept is, you know, you can do stuff quickly and cheaply, but just know that you'll have to rework and fix some of these things. And the key here is, you know, I think having good corporate counsel is so important because they'll help you figure out, um, hey, these are the things that are unfixable or very expensive to fix later on or, or impossible to fix when you're in a fast moving company or in a fast moving deal uh, and help you avoid some of those, some of those issues. Yeah, I think that I, I just add really quickly, I, I think you're 100% right in that, um, you know, it's all about cost benefit. And to, to be clear, you know, I do think that if you can convince uh, a good attorney that it's time for them to jump in and be your partner, it can be super, super valuable because I've seen a lot of founders try and do all this stuff on their own and they've spent a, an, an enormous amount, a huge personal resource debt in trying to get this stuff right. And it's usually not right. Even the smartest founders, like there are reasons that, you know, I don't know that I learned that much about what I do in law school, but there's a reason I've been doing it 23 years and we charge a lot by the hour. It's because I've been doing it for 23 years and hopefully I can see around the corners a little bit. Um, and, and that's super important. And there are things that you can't fix 
like it's pretty hard to fix an 83B election. And oh, by the way, if you publicly, you know, disclose your invention in the, you're, you could destroy your ability to get a patent. I mean, these are things that getting good advisors, if you're serious about starting a company, you don't necessarily have to spend a ton of money to get these things done. But if you're serious about it, engage the right advisors and get the right advice because nobody knows how to do everything on their own. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great point. And I kind of think it leads in uh, nicely to the next question, which is, all right, let's say the startup's doing well. Um, you know, they've raised a little bit of money. They've got a little bit of breathing room. They've got a little bit of runway. You know, then the lawyer becomes also very important. And this is where you start to think about, well, do I want to, you know, go with outside GC or maybe even get my own in-house attorney? Because now we're drafting partnership agreements. Now we're issuing, issuing employee socks and we're doing more raises. Um, and Kev, you said, Kevin, you said that your experience is kind of, uh, you know, in this phase after they get that financing. So do you want to talk about sort of the role of the attorney sort of when things are going well and as companies scale? Yeah. Um, and I've actually... I've worked with companies kind of uh, on a broad spectrum of what they decide to do at that point once once they do have money or they're growing. And um, so sometimes it's very few things where the, there's a contract that, that they want uh, reviewed or negotiated. And so I'll deal with that. But I know very little about the inner workings and the operation of their company. They give me the bare minimum and I do the best I can with that. And then there's some companies where it's every legal thing that they bring my way and then everything in between. <laughs> and um, one of the biggest things, and, and this goes along with a lot of what we've talked about with communication and uh, trusting an attorney, um, it's hard to do my job, no matter how good I am at the specific technical aspect of the company or how well-versed I am with their operations. Um, and I've, I found this, I find this especially true when it comes to uh, companies that are developing apps and software um, to just make sure that you're giving the attorney all the information that you can. And now I, I generally just, I put that on, I just assume that's, that's going to be on myself. And um, sometimes I, I play dumb so that I can get what I need out of them because, uh, and I think sometimes it helps them too, especially with uh, companies that are starting brand new um, SaaS products or just building new software for a new company for a, you know a different reason than what they may have done in the past. It's something new that when they're able to to communicate that to me, it I, I can't even explain how much better I can do because it's like I can know the law and everything, but when you can't when you don't marry it with facts, and this is especially true with my with my background in uh, litigation, that uh, the facts is a, a lot of what you're, a majority of what you're arguing about. And um, if you don't know the facts, you can't ac correctly apply the law to it. And so in understanding risk and foreseeing uh, potential problems and, and advising against that or protecting um, against potential major issues, the communication with uh, the attorney. And uh, if they're not, if they're not drawing the information out of you, uh, make sure you're asking it of them. But I think in, in general, most attorneys that I've worked with and know that it's, uh, it's hard to do stuff when you don't have much of the facts and the whole I, I, I get a lot of, oh, this is a standard contract. We just want you to review a standard contract. I hear that all the time. <laughs> there's very, very few industries that I've worked in where there's a true standard contract. And that's generally from some government agency. Um, I think like for real estate, certain situations where um, there's standard form contracts. But in general, it's like standard contract for one company is standard for them. So they're going to have standard terms that benefit them. And uh, or or companies that will come and say, oh, it's just can you just do a quick one page uh, contract about something? A quick one page master service agreement. It's like <laughs> sure. a, a master service agreement. I mean, they don't call it a master service agreement. But um, yeah, it's uh, so it's it's a broad range of of uh, experience that I have with how much they allow me to get involved. And again, that's a lot 
has to do with their budget. And then also they're busy as well. So sometimes I have to do stuff on my own. And, um, but yeah, it's just kind of a balancing act, but trying to get as much information as I can to understand what their needs are and whatever the product is, if it's a certain transaction with another company or licensing agreement or privacy policies. Yeah. Uh, make sure you're communicating well. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I like to think that lawyer confidentiality should come in here. But I think that what sometimes gets in the way is that these founders are so used to pitching to investors oh. and to salespeople. And so they're like, yeah, I've got a machine learning blockchain enabled tech platform that allows a marketplace for blah, blah, blah. And you're just like, who pays you to do what? I, if you want me to figure out the legal implications here, I need to know exactly what's going on. And Samar, I'm sure you experience the same thing sometimes when people talk about patents. You know, They have a way of describing it that is so jargon infused that it kind of gets in the way of like the truth. And so I think that as lawyers, you have, we kind of have to differentiate and kind of go into the weeds and be like, well, okay, so you're really just an app. Okay. So you're trying to make Facebook. Okay, cool. Just tell me that because then I can, you know, make the right decisions. I also think that in terms of the getting what you pay for, um, I think back to uh, an artist drew this really interesting thing. And they're like, I charge this much an hour to do drawings. And people often say, well, can't you just do it faster? And so that they take like what they could do in 10 minutes and they make a really beautiful drawing and then they do five minutes and then they do one minute and then they do 20 seconds. And by the 20 second point, it's like a stick figure. And so I think that lawyers are kind of similar. You know, if you want a one page MSA, I, yeah, I can do that. It'll cover you basically nothing that you really want. It's not going to be, uh, you know, complex enough to handle your situation. And I think that that's how we need to think about uh, legal problems and legal solutions, which is the complexity needs to match. If you have a really straightforward, I'm raising money from one investor who's giving me $100,000 for 10% of my business in common stock. Well, that's much easier. But if you want to raise multiple you know, rounds or uh, different uh, kinds of stock or you have preferred terms, then it becomes more complicated. And this is where the role of the lawyer gets really, really important. Um, I also think, uh, just really quickly, I also think that clients sometimes think that they can control cost by controlling information. And I think that's incredibly dangerous. And you should look at your relationship with your lawyer if that's what you're doing and have a real candid conversation. Because, well, as Kevin was saying, we, we can't do our job in the absence of facts, you know, and it just doesn't work that way. And I can't give you good advice on risk. And we can't have clear communications because a contract, you know, hopefully you have the contract discussion and both parties now understand each other and you throw the contract in the drawer and nobody ever looks at it again. But if you don't know the facts and I give you a piece of paper, you can have a totally different result and understanding from the other side based on that. And the number of times I've gotten the same conversation that Kevin was laying out there that oh, I just want the standard contract for this. And, oh, this is what they served up. And I'm like, we don't do this. Like, I actually understand your business and this is not how what we do works and what they've asked for, we don't do. And oh, by the way, when we're done with this, they're going to own the IP that you created out of this. Is this really what you intended? And they're like, no. And I'm like, okay, so we need to actually talk about this then. Yeah, I think that's a, a fantastic point, Dave. I actually just wrote down that quote. Um, I think that you nailed it. It's Startups try to control costs by controlling information, and this is very dangerous. And I think further to your point, if this is your case, it sounds like you don't trust your attorney and you need to rethink that relationship. Um, we've got a little bit of time left here. I do want to jump into something that given kind of everybody's tech background, let's talk about legal tech. Um, I think it's something in the startup space. Um, what have you guys seen? Anything that excites you? Trends, companies, um, you know, as lawyers, tech is a huge part of our, our, our roles now. And as we kind of you know, technology becomes more pervasive in uh, the legal field, I think it's sort of changing. So how do you guys sort of see that playing out? Yeah, you know, it's actually a pretty exciting time to be a technologist, especially in the patent space. Um, about five years ago, the USPTO opened up its API. Um, so that allows you to pull a lot of data from the patent office that normally would have been impossible to pull. Uh, so there's legal, you know, um, IP tech companies that are helping um, 
you know, process that data and get intelligence out of that data. Um, and one of the reasons I left my big firm is because I wanted to work on some of this stuff. Uh, so we um, are developing software where we're pulling data from Crunchbase or PitchBook uh, and um, getting investor or venture capital data or startup company data. And we're, you know, matching that up with data that we get from the USPTO. And we're trying to find trends uh, about how, um, valuations uh, correlate to patent filings for startups, um, how, um, you know, growth rates uh, change. And, you know, we're trying to, you know, if we can pull uh, patent licensing data from public documents or from court documents, we're able to start correlating all that information together um, and um, put a more strategic picture uh, in front of our clients so that they can make smarter decision about, about patents in terms of when to file, whether to file, what, uh, what type of filing to prioritize, um, you know, based on data, whereas before it was, uh, I think, a, a, a lot based on your kind of personal experience, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so there's that. And there are other companies in the patent space that are, um, you know, trying to figure out how examiners at the patent office will prosecute a patent application, what kind of arguments work, right? Um, when I was at a big firm, I could just go down the hall and ask my colleagues if they, you know, dealt with a particular exam. Um, but, you know, I don't have that luxury anymore, right? Uh, and uh, having uh, large data sets that I can kind of call upon and make strategic decisions about whether to narrow a claim or to keep pushing the examiner on broader claims, that kind of stuff is, you know, enabled by having data. Um, so it's, it's actually very cool. And I think, uh, you know, it's something that um, clients should think about and certainly lawyers should think about to help, you know, advance their clients' causes. Yeah, I, I was just going to say with a quick thing on legal technology, as I mentioned before, my background, that's really what got me into law and where I was, uh, some of my, my skills were most valued at the firm that I was working at, and um, it was in litigation. But I've, I've also found that over the past five years, especially that it's become a very crowded space in almost whether it was the litigation thing, uh, whether it's timekeeping, case management, document, like e-discovery. Um, and then even in the in-house counsel uh, contract management software, and there's, there's nuances and how these all connect and, and there's just a ton of companies out there. And so if I have a, uh, personal relationship with somebody that's starting a company. I even, I was trying to do some of this when I was in law school, didn't work out. I wasn't, uh, I had to study a little bit more, so I, I wasn't able to do it. I remember trying to do something over a, a winter break, but you, you can't start a company like that. But um, uh, I, at, at this point, because I love learning about these new things and doing demos and I will occasionally do these things, but I found, and I still have attorneys even back in California that will, and uh, uh, law firms that will contact me about uh, new technology. And it's got to the point now where it's like, when I find something, I stick with it, but I also use a variety of tools depending on the situation I'm in. And uh, there's, a, you know, it's constantly growing and, and you know, there will continue to be uh, upgrades and uh, especially with the um, computer assisted technology or um, there's various words for it in the machine learning stuff that uh, it, it, there's a lot there, but also don't get too bogged down and, you know, use technology where you can, but um, don't get too bogged down in how much there is. Cause I know me personally, like I love it and, but you get overwhelmed with how much there is out there today. So. Yeah, definitely. Dave? I think there's a ton of things that enable us as legal practitioners to focus on where we can add that. And I think if you partner with the right people and use tech, as Kevin said, efficiently and effectively where it can really add value or cut cost, it, it's, it's just a really interesting space. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I think that there's sort of a lot of innovation. A lot of the ways that law is practiced is, I think, anachronistic. And I think that as we see a lot of machine learning and a lot more data involved, as Samar said, uh, you know, I think we're going to see law become, uh, you know, much more efficiently practiced. Uh, and maybe that uh, those ridiculously billable hours will switch to fixed fees eventually. Um, but time will tell. Um, awesome. We're about wrapping up here. This has been really, really interesting. I think we touched on a, a lot of really great points. Uh, Kevin, Dave, Samar, I can't thank you guys enough. 
Uh, I appreciate everyone's time and uh, yeah, everyone, thanks for, thanks for coming by.